So when Russia first began their invasion of Ukraine, many had expected Russia would swiftly take over the country, but the Ukrainian people had proven to be more resilient than previously thought. So what are the implications of an extended war in the Ukraine for global energy security in the short and more medium and more long-term future? In some ways, I think the repercussions have already baked in. Um, <clears throat> So on the one hand is Russian production, and it has been far more resilient than anyone thought. So the sanctions were applied, and we expected these sanctions to harm their ability to produce oil and also put a cap on so there was a less incentive to produce it. But for a variety of reasons, uh, Russian production has remained pretty resilient. I still think at some point um, their supply chains will harm, will, you know, will hurt, and the, the low cost of oil that they're getting will hurt and Russian production will go down, but it hasn't happened yet. But we've already seen where their markets have diversified to. And so a lot of, they still are, by the way, selling a lot of uh, LNG and, and oil to Europe. Europe can't get off Russian oil. So re Europe will progressively try to get off Russian oil and LNG, but it doesn't exist in the market. But we are seeing a reorientation uh, to a lot of Russian exports to India, Number one, India is just consuming an enormous amount at a good rate of a Russian product, and then obviously China. So we are seeing that reorientation in the global market. So in the so it uh, so it almost doesn't matter if the war ended today. Western countries aren't going to try. You know, it'll take a long time for Western countries to want to buy from Russia again, and the multinational corporations have pulled out of Russia. And it will be a long time before any multinationals want to go and set up shop in Russia because they just lost billions of dollars pulling out. So they aren't. It's not going to be a you know a reversal in that decision anytime soon. So I think the, the damage has been done. I also happen to think that the war is going to go on for a long time, and so so it'll just it'll just continue along this path. I don't see any reversal anytime soon. So you were talking a little bit about the countries that are currently buying Russian oil. So you mentioned India. Um, so what major countries are still buying oil and gas from Russia? And how do you see this changing in the near and distant future? So there's a question of to what extent can Europe get off Russian natural gas and oil? And they're doing their darndest to reduce their consumption, which they are, and then to fill with the consumption they still have with American production. And the Americans have just been producing at gangbusters and, and to everyone's benefit and to Canada's shame that we didn't pick up any of that slack, that they've had to rely on American LNG, but the Americans have stepped up. Um, and then India is buying more and people had to appreciate, you know, this happened this year that India became the biggest, most populous country in the world, surpassed China. And, and has far better economic prospects than China because China's demography is now on the decline. China will start to age and its population will soon peak. Whereas India is now expected to be that growth engine. The, the one very large um, super giant emerging economy that has a high growth rate. So India is a very attractive economy to kind of hop on for the Russians and for anyone because they do have that high growth rate. Uh, and they are seeing their oil consumption increase and they are reducing absolute levels of poverty. So more people in the middle class in India are consuming more energy. So that's a great market for Russia. And India is kind of non-aligned. I don't think I don't think they'd rather be with India than United States and Canada, but they're big enough to be non-aligned and they can get the cheapest energy from Russia. So can't you can't fault them for that. They're getting cheaper energy from there. Now, other allies that are a little bit richer uh, and are not aligned, that are aligned, like Japan and South Korea, do want, do have a greater interest to get off Russian imports. And of course, they were reliant on Russia and also OPEC. So, for example, when TMX goes into service, you know, Japan is ready to take on that oil. Um, you know, other Asian uh, friendly countries are ready to take on that Canadian oil to help them get off dependence on Russia. So, uh, so, so that's some of the answer, I guess. I'm so glad you mentioned Japan there, because again, you're leading me perfectly into these next questions. Um, but what I wanted to ask here was that so months after Canada released its long-awaited Indo-Pacific strategy, which made no mention of LNG, 
and after uh, Japanese Prime Minister, I apologies if I butcher this name, uh, Fumio Kishida uh, visited Ottawa and it failed to result in any LNG projects being committed to, um, despite the Japanese Prime Minister emphasizing the crucial role of LNG in Japan's energy transition. Japan recently became the first G7 country to break the $60 a, a barrel cap on uh, Russian oil imports. What would you say is the significance of this purchase? Are we likely to see other countries within the G7 breaking this cap in the near future? And if so, who? And what can Canada do to prevent allied countries to, um, from, from uh, buying Russian oil in, uh, in the immediate or long-term future? So the only thing to do in the immediate future is get TMX online. It's going to happen and will increase, you know, it, add, it will, it would be significant for global production. And that's how big of a pipeline it is with I think a max capacity of five or 600,000 barrels addition to the existing TMX. So, so, you know, the world consumes about hundred, 102 million barrels a day. So it's, you know, less, it's half of a percent. But in terms of some of that margin of getting off Russian oil, it's important. But what people have to appreciate that we've, you know, we, we imagine that we're in a world where fossil fuels are on decline and, and you know, um, we're producing too much oil and we'll have stranded assets. And right now what we see is, is pretty much the opposite, that oil demand is still growing at, by almost every kind of expert analysis will grow into the next decade. And then we'll probably plateau rather than decline. because. Because the other 7 billion people are, you know, will grow to 8 billion, we'll have 9 billion people here, and they will be consuming more energy. So regardless of what the EU or Japan or the United States or Canada does, those other 7 billion people will want to consume more energy. And oil just happens to be very, very affordable. So, so what can Canada do is think about that medium and long term. Is there a way as shale oil declines for Canada to step up and fill the void so that OPEC and Russia don't get more and more market share, which is, you know, we've seen their market share decline with shale oil, but now we're going to see reversal and people anticipate that OPEC plus again will have more market share. And that creates vulnerabilities on the energy security side that um, if OPEC plus now controls 30% and we can see that in 20 years, they'll control 60% of global oil markets, then we can become very vulnerable to their whims. Um, and we saw that in the 70s, there was an entire decade of crisis and inflation because of that. So there's a really important role that we have to start thinking about is what is the role of Canadian oil in 10 years and in 20 years? If we expect that even in, in the best forecast by 2050, we'll still need 50 million barrels of oil. Well, some of it better come from an OECD country. Some of it better come from the West. We cannot let all of it come from OPEC uh, and from Russia. So, you know, Japan sees this and is asking us for our oil and asking us for LNG. Um, and some people want to, uh, you know, be very optimistic and think that we just won't need this in 20 years. So the problem will resolve itself. And I think we better prepare for the worst. And if that happens, that happens. But we had better make sure there is some ability of getting Canadian supply out the door in the worst case scenario. So another current event that I really wanted to get your opinion on um, was that Turkey, which is a NATO member country, uh, has been in cooperation with Russia on nuclear energy as the, again, apologies if I butcher this name, as the Akuya or Akuyu uh, nuclear power plant in Turkey's southern Mersin province uh, was built by Russian state nuclear or energy company uh, Ros Rosatom. Uh, what, in your view, are the implications of this collaboration? And as a fellow NATO member state and a producer of nuclear energy, how should Canada be responding? Well, you know, Turkey, Turkey's, you know, positions are a big problem um, in general for NATO. But that's, a, you know, but focusing on this particular issue, I don't think people appreciate, I think nuclear is really an important solution for low carbon, you know, uh, you know, energy and, and energy dance, a great source of energy, it's the future. And Canada is in a great position to provide. So, but what has happened till now is that Russia has had a real monopoly on enriched uranium. So we produce kind of raw, um, un unenriched uranium. And then a handful of our allies, you know, in France, the United States and the UK that have nuclear reactors do enrich it. 
Uh, but our own reactors don't use enriched uranium. They use the natural uranium in our candy reactors. So we've never been enriching. The reason why Russia has, you know, um, you know, 40% of the market share um, of enriched uranium is because they just have been downgrading their old weapons grade uranium. And so it's very cheap. It's very cheap. It's a lot harder for us to enrich than for Russia to just downgrade and sell it. So through Rosatom, they've they've been a really big supplier. And as the, the last since Fukushima and even since from Chernobyl have really stopped building nuclear reactors since the 80s and 90s. Uh, you know, in Asia and Russia and Turkey and other parts, they have been increasing, they have been growing their reactors. And so they've been, you know, continuing this nuclear economy while ours has somewhat stagnated. And now we're seeing a reversal of this. We're seeing the creation of SMRs. We're seeing the growth of nuclear energy again. We're seeing the interest of the West in nuclear. So now we have to look at how are we going to displace this Russian hold on the enriched uranium market, and not least that so many of our Central and Eastern European allies who don't want to be dependent on Russia are totally dependent on Russian enriched uranium supply. So in fact, in the last few months, a lot has changed. Um, we're seeing Cameco has been signing you know, deals. Cameco is a Saskatchewan-based uranium miner, signing deals for millions and millions of pounds of, of uranium to um, you know, Ukraine, to Poland, to areas like that. Um, selling lots of long-term contracts. And we've seen just last month, the G7, not the G7, because Germany um, just got out of the nuclear game and so is Italy, but the other five, Japan, UK, Canada, the United States, um, who's the fifth? France, having an alliance to, to enhance the security of the nuclear fuel chain. And, and this is the quote from the UK government to get Putin out of the nuclear fuel supply chain. That means that we're some of us are going to have to enrich. I think Canada probably should think seriously about getting into the enrichment game uh, to supply small modular reactors. And small modular reactors require a high assay, low enriched uranium, but it has a higher enrichment content than what we've been seeing in, in the normal reactors. Uh, and so far, only Russia produces on a commercially available basis this HALU, this high assay, low enriched uranium. So some of us have to start producing this HALU and some of it have to start enriching uranium that Russia has been filling the market with. Uh, and Canada is a big part of this solution. And it's also a huge economic opportunity for us. We have every competitive advantage because we have the uranium and we have a nuclear sector. Um, and actually this is one area where the federal government is actually on board and has been supporting some of this. So the last couple of questions I wanted to ask you about a couple of articles that you wrote recently. So one of the ones that I found super fascinating um, was that in a recent article you wrote about the idea that sounds like it would be some part of a science fiction movie, but apparently is about to become a reality in the not so distant future. Mining on the moon. So would you be able to tell me what you know about the logistics of what moon mining would look like? And what would, be, what would we be mining on the moon? and which countries can we first expect to be the first moon miners? Great question. So, so just you know, linking it back to your first question too, of when you're a student and you're thinking what your career is going to be. Here I am a political scientist with expertise in the Arctic, but I've been able to do some, you know, some collaboration with the Canadian Space Mining Corporation and learn a lot about this. I think I probably know more than almost any other political scientist because there are no other political scientists working on this. Um, so your career, you know, if you're a good writer and a good thinker, your, your career can take you in a lot of places. So, so when I first, you know, when you hear first hear about moon mining or asteroid mining, I think, you know, in your initial inclination is that's crazy. It would be so expensive. And, and the idea, so the, the first idea here isn't really that we're going to go to the moon and bring back iron. You know, that would be crazy. Uh, we have plenty of iron here. The idea is that we are going to establish a permanent human presence on the moon. It's the Artemis missions. It's going to happen. NASA is making this happen. Canada's on board. We are contributing to it. And so if those humans are on that moon permanently, it is too expensive to bring resources from Earth. And so how do we sustain that human production? What is the water we need? What is the fuel we need so that you can have that permanent presence on, on, on the moon without having to bring it from the earth, which is too expensive. So that's why they're looking for, where is there ice? And if there's ice, you can have water and then you can grow things. And if you have water, then you have hydrogen and oxygen. 
Um, so you can breathe the oxygen and you can make the hydrogen into a fuel and operate, you know, your, your lunar vehicles or whatever. You might also want to bring some small modular reactors to the moon because they, they don't need a lot of refueling. They last a long time, obviously a tremendous source of energy and then solar. Uh, and so a lot, you know, the International Space Station relies on solar, very quality, obviously the highest quality, potent, you know, potential of anywhere of solar panels on the ISS. So, so the thinking is, how do we, re, how do we extract these resources on the moon to support our presence on the moon? And which then you're like, okay, well, that makes sense. But we had to figure this out in 10 years. If you think we're going to have a lunar base in 10 years, and Russia and China also have that same goal, by the way. Um, we think about it takes it takes 15 years to build a mine in Canada. So so 10 years is not a long time to figure out how you're going to get the robotics and materials and the equipment to the moon and then separate it and in this elegant way make hydrogen and make oxygen and make water. Um, so that's what people are working on right now. Again, an area where Canada should have every competitive economic advantage. We're very good at mining. We're very good at mining in remote places, and we're actually really good at space robotics. And so if you were to divide up, you know, all the Western world, European Space Agency, Canadian Space Agency, NASA, and you'd say, who's going to take on the mining? The answer should be Canada. You know, how about Canada takes on the mining and, and you know, you figure out the lunar vehicle and you figure out this and that. So people are working on it. Uh, there's not a ton of government support, uh, but the beauty of being better at mining on the moon is that you would probably become better at mining in the Arctic or other remote places. Um, uh, you know, just more sustainable, less waste, less, you know, just smarter, innovative ways that you may never be pushed to do right here on the moon. So that's some of the benefit. Then the other part of the article was that there is actually something that we want on the moon that we don't have on Earth. And that's the isotope of helium, of helium-3. And so right now when we do nuclear energy and we use uranium, that's uh, fission. But the other kind of nuclear energy would come from fission, uh, or fusion, sorry, which is what the sun does. So um, fission takes very heavy elements and splits them and fusion take very light elements like helium and fuse them together. So this isotope of helium almost does not exist on earth at all, but it does exist on the moon helium three. And so potentially you would not, you would only need you, a few thousand tons of helium three to power all of earth, uh, with, with fusion in theory. So that means that all those billions still be very expensive, but they'd each be worth billions of dollars. And all of a sudden it is economical to go to the moon, take a ton of helium three uh, and bring it back to earth because that single ton of helium three, uh, you know, could power millions of households. Well, very fascinating. I, I like when I first read that article about mining on the moon, my mind was totally blown and I felt like I went to like my little like six year old science fiction uh, nerd phase. But so another article that you wrote not so long ago for the Globe and Mail, uh, where you talked about the Canadian critical mineral strategy, you stated that while the rate of oil and gas spending could hit net zero targets by 2050, mining is way off that pace. And current government strategies will not even be close, or will not even be close to that gap. Um, do you think that Canada should be prioritizing investments in resources other or other than critical minerals like lithium, graphite, nickel, cobalt, copper, and rare earth elements, or is it better to continue it in prioritizing investments in these industries and accept the reality that they will be insufficient to replace oil and gas by 2050? So, I mean. I don't think Canada should be picking and choosing. We should be filling the market gap wherever we can to our benefit for our workers and our industry and our, you know, tax base and, and royalties and all those things. So, but here's the, here's the context is that the, to reach, to decarbonize by 2050, the International Energy Agency and many others have um, analyzed that we need about six times more mining. And I mentioned before, renewables happen to be very mining intense. The so, you, don't, you don't turn the sun and the wind into electricity with nothing. It's very mineral intensive. Uh, so for the transmission, for the magnets, for the turbines, all those things. So they say we need six times more mineral production uh, to displace fossil fuels from what we have today. And when you look at the data, again, 
now all the governments are on side and Canada has a critical mineral strategy in the United States and they have these G7, you know, alliances and, and bilateral agreements. But actually in the mining world, we're not seeing an increase of investment at all. That the price, there are not the price signals today to encourage more mining. So we actually aren't even mining as much as we were in 2019 globally. There's some data came out just last week. The world is mining less today than we were in 2019. But we're also producing less oil and gas. Um, and so, so what's going to make up the shortfall? We, you know, we, won't, we don't have as much oil and gas as we used to. We haven't been investing in that either. But we're not investing concomitantly on the other side of the ledger in mining. And so even in Canada, same thing. It's happening globally. It's also happening in Canada. That we actually produce fewer critical minerals this year than we did in 2019. We produce less copper. We produce less nickel. We produce less graphite. We produce less uh, uranium. And our one tiny little rare earth mine uh, just suspended production last month. So we are far from reaching this goal of, of you know, sextupling, let alone doubling or tripling or quadrupling, sextupling production. The world is producing less. Um, and so that's a scary thing. People say, why is that? If we all know that there's going to be demand, from a miner's perspective, now we're in this very high interest rate environment. It takes 12 to 15 years in Canada, but it takes a long time everywhere to do the exploration, to get the environmental approvals. There's a lot more scrutiny on the environment. The workforce is aging everywhere. The grades that people are exploring for are worse. We've already kind of found the best grades in the world in the last couple of decades. So now we're looking at lower grade reserves that haven't been developed yet. And the cost of capital, when interest rates were 1% versus being 5 or 6% now, well, if you have to carry the cost of a $5 billion mine, uh, you know, of a project over 10, 15 years, the cost of capital, the cost of interest on that project becomes astronomical. That's one reason why TMX was so expensive. It's the cost of capital. And so the, the commodity prices for these minerals has to be so much higher than they are right now to induce that risk. Um, from the miners of all the different ways that that the mining industry has changed from 30 years ago. So those are all the big questions I have for you today. Um, thank you so much. Now, are there any final thoughts or messages relating to resource and energy that you have for young Canadians? Yeah, get into the sector. Um, you know, there's, you know, a lot of doom and gloom. And things are a little bit scary, and I think the world will be a bit of a scarier place for the next few decades. But honestly, there's nowhere you'd rather be in the entire world than in Canada and in Western Canada. Uh, the world needs our resources, and we need you know all you brilliant young minds to figure out how to do it in a sustainable, responsible way, but also in a timely way, um, so that we can meet our security, our environmental, uh, and our economic goals. So, so encourage uh, that people are starting to come back into the sector. We will never not need raw materials and we will never not need them from Canada. So I'll end it there. Awesome, thank you so much. Mm -hmm.